<laughs> hey, Rodent. <laughs> I've been nervous. <laughs> Alright. Hey, Reddit. I'm working on this series. <clears throat> hey, Reddit. I'm working on this series of projects where I spend about 70 hours addressing questions that we don't hear every day. I've been seeing a lot of misinformation on this topic of martial arts on Reddit for a good 7 years now, so I decided to tackle the question. For my next project, I want to spend my next 2 weeks answering one of your questions. The more unusual, the better. So whatever you guys upvote the highest will be my next 70 hours or so. There's more context inside the thread if you want to know more. Cheers. In 1993, a Dragon Ball-like World Martial Arts Tournament was held in the United States where all different types of martial arts was represented. This tournament was promoted as a tournament to end all the arguments. Thousands of years worth of smack talk between different cultures were to end on November 12, 1993. The tournament was originally titled War of the Worlds. This was after the idea of the karate world colliding with the boxing world and the judo world colliding with the kung fu world, etc. The tournament was an 8-man single elimination tournament and all of the competitors were either champions or experts in their respective disciplines. We have Taekwondo, shoot fighting, boxing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Karate, kickboxing, sumo, and savat. Better yet, there would be no rounds, no judges, and no rules. For the first time on the global stage, there was a spotlight on the question, what is the single best martial arts? Before we get started, please consider liking this video on YouTube if you learn anything. It really helps with the algorithm and it helps other people find this video. To put into context what this tournament means, I need to put emphasis that before this tournament, on a global stage, there was mostly just verbal discussions about the best martial arts. You guys know the conversation. Boxing is better than Taekwondo. No, Taekwondo uses leg kicks, man. The boxer won't be able to come close to the Taekwondo fighter. Yeah, but what if the boxer catches the guy midway? Well, in the Karate Kid, you know the wax on, wax off thing? How would boxers deal with that? They couldn't. Well, Bruce Lee in The Hidden Dragon. The conversations were filled with hypotheticals, and they went absolutely nowhere. Presumably, this tournament was the beginning of truly understand combat as we do our world with modern science, through empirical evidence. As we all know, the world believed in all types of voodoo doo, -doo for millions of years before the scientific method. With only centuries after the scientific revolution, we go from burning people for being witches to being able to watch Philip DeFranco on our magic pocket devices. Science just works. This tournament, much like science, gave the opportunity for each martial arts to test their hypothesis of being the most effective. In the first round, we have Savat vs Sumo. Savat is a French stand-up style of fighting that incorporates punches and kicks, and sumo is a Japanese wrestling style that focuses mostly on stand-up grappling. To represent Savat, we have a Savat champion Gerard Gardeau at 6'5 and 216 pounds. And to represent sumo, we have Taylor Tuli, a professional sumo wrestler at 6'2 and 410 pounds. Allegedly, and I repeat allegedly, Tuli got kicked out of the Japanese circuit for pushing a reporter into a glass window and shattering the thing. Both fighters enter the stage and are now ready to compete. Gordo is as cool as can be and Tuli shakes his legs ready to throw down. There's a strange tension in the air. Nobody really knows what's about to happen. The sumo wrestler rushes the Savat fighter and the Savat fighter catches the wrestler, knocking him down. As he tries to get back up, the Savat World Champion hand kicks the sumo wrestler, sending a couple of the sumo wrestler's teeth towards the crowd. Oh, just missing teeth there. And just like that, the fight is over. In less than 30 seconds, Savat just beats sumo. No flashy choreography like in the movies, no crazy back and forths, just a solid punch and kick. In the second round, we have karate versus kickboxing. For kickboxing, we have Kevin Rozier, advertised as 6'2", 265 pounds. The dude also had a giant fist called Marianne. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just take that for what that's worth. And for karate, we have a big black dude in Zane Frazier, a karate champion who also did bodyguard work for guys like Stevie Wonder. He was 6'6", and 230 pounds at the night of the fight. The fight starts and the kickboxer hunts down the karate fighter and lands a punch at the back of the head. The karate fighter drops and covers his head. The kickboxer, failing to capitalize on this, gives the karate fighter the opportunity to stand up. 
With a vengeance, the karate champion grabs hold of the kickboxer's hair and starts to wreck the kickboxer. That's a strategy of pulling hair. Yeah. yeah. And that's something that wasn't talked about in the rules meeting. It should be legal. It should be allowed. This beating goes on for a solid minute until the karate fighter gets absolutely exhausted. Learning from his past lesson, this time the kickboxer capitalizes on the situation. The kickboxer drops the karate fighter with a punch and begins to stomp on the head of the karate fighter. I really think that the fatigue set in, and when the fatigue set in, there was no defense. Exactly. I remember watching this and saying, Jesus fucking Christ. Dude, this is nothing like in the movies, man. What? Two ambulances were called after the first two fights. Both fighters were critically injured. In the next round, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, an art that focuses on ground fighting, faces off against boxing. For Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we have Hoist Gracie, who is a direct lineage to the creator of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. As the smallest guy in the tournament, Hoist stands at 6'1 and 178 pounds. Luckily for the underdog, his opponent was Art Jimerson, the second smallest man in the tournament at 6'1 and 196 pounds. The fight starts hesitantly by both fighters, but eventually the Brazilian takes down the boxer and smothers him on top. Now also this is making one of them very very tired, which is Art Jimerson on the bottom because he's got to try to push him off. The boxer, clueless on what to do on the ground, panics and taps out. There is confusion in the crowd as to what has happened. The fight was super strange. There wasn't even a single punch thrown in the fight. But a tap is a tap. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu moves on to the next round. There were other fights too. Ken Shamrock, the representative of shoot fighting, ends the fight with the Taekwondo black belt relatively quickly. And the Savat champion makes quick work of the 265 pound kickboxer. The other fight to determine who would go on to the finals was between Hoist Gracie, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fighter, versus Jack Boy Ken Shamrock. Just by looking at the remaining three fighters, I think I would definitely put my money on Shamrock. Look at this guy. The guy was 6 foot, 220 pounds. Dude, look at those abs, man. <laughs> those things could probably create cheese or something. And on the other side of the arena was the smallest man in competition, weighing in only at 178 pounds. There's a 40 pound difference between the two competitors. And to put this into context, the 40 pound difference in Olympic boxing is like fighting someone who is two weight classes above you. And we're ready to start, ladies and gentlemen. I think this will be a very exciting battle. Here they go. The fight starts and Shamrock shows his superior strength right away. Going to the ground, Shamrock gets on top. But out of nowhere, Gracie reverses the position on the 220 pound man. And with speed, Gracie maneuvers his hands around Shamrock's neck takes the back and gets the choke. What happened? I don't know. They basically choked him out, though. Oh, yeah. wow, that's fantastic. I think this is the fight that put Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on the map. Not only was Gracie outsized by 40 pounds, but without taking a single punch, Gracie subdued a man that was obviously stronger than him. The finals? The finals is how you would expect the finals to go. In a matter of seconds, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner clenches the Savat fighter and takes him to the ground. And in a very anticlimactic fashion, Hoist Gracie gets on the back of the opponent and chokes him out. Hoist Gracie won all of his bouts while taking virtually no damage, and all while being the smaller man. He was on average 30 pounds lighter than his opponents. But it's just one tournament, right? It could have been a fluke. Hoist Gracie showed everybody that it was no fluke. Still undersized, Hoist Gracie went to the next tournament and obliterated. In this event, there was Ninjutsu, Karate, Taekwondo, Wing Chun, Sambo, Sansun, Muay Thai, Kickboxing, Jiu Jitsu, Benkatsilat, and Shaolin Kung Fu. And still, Hoist Gracie ended up on top. In the tournament after that, Hoist Gracie wins his first round bout but withdraws from the next round due to fatigue or injury. In his fourth tournament, Hoist comes out on top again. The Gracie's victory set a shockwave around the martial arts world. Using just elementary moves, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu dominated other styles of combat. The first tournament, now known as UFC 1, is arguably the most important event in combat history. From here on out, the world approached combat differently. Today, 
Every competitive fighter knows at least some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and 100% of all UFC champions could hold their own on the ground. What I failed to mention in the beginning of this video is that prior to UFC 1, for decades, the Gracie family actually put on challenges for other martial arts. And for decades, the Gracie faced all types of martial arts styles and had an incredible record. For UFC 1, the Gracies actually nominated Hoist as their representative, not because he was their best fighter, but actually because he was the smallest man in the family. These guys just want to show the world that with their martial arts, even the smaller man can beat the bigger man with the right technique. Nowadays, the Gracies are seen as a legendary family, the most important family in combat history. While I think the beginning of the UFC is interesting, what is even more fascinating is seeing how fighting evolved. Like science, after conducting many experiments, we begin to systematically learn what works and what doesn't work. This same system of acquiring knowledge is reflected in the UFC. In the later UFCs, you begin to see many competitors adopting Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to their skill set. And for those who refused, they kept losing and they got cut. People began to properly mix up the martial arts. For those who knew wrestling, they were then able to experiment with wrestling and fighting without worrying too much about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. With thousands of experiments, we began to clearly see what works and what doesn't work. What is voo doo doo and what is real. And the most exciting part of it all is that the sport and thus our knowledge of combat is still growing. In every fight, there's an experiment going on. If a technique, say a calf kick, helps a fighter win, other fighters will conduct similar experiments and test the hypothesis of the effectiveness of the calf kick. This is similar to how scientists conduct peer review. A scientist would test a hypothesis, conduct experiments, and then let other people conduct the same experiment. If a technique truly works, fighters acknowledge their utility and train either to add it to their skill set or to defend against it. Next time you catch an MMA event, notice the common techniques that these competitors use. Their favorite towards the rear naked chokes, the double leg takedowns, the front kicks, the oblique kicks, the calf kicks, the guillotine chokes, the triangle chokes. You get the point. All of these techniques weren't randomly chosen. All of these moves that I've listed have been tested rigorously under the microscope. Through empirical evidence, we begin to learn the truth of what truly works in combat. What is even more beautiful in my opinion is that this knowledge base is ever growing. In every fight, there is an experiment going on and in every fight, competitors are taking notes and getting ready to conduct their own experiments. Like science, I'm fascinated by what technology will be like in a decade. With the same enthusiasm, I'm fascinated in how the meta of the fight game will look in 10 years. If you learned something, please consider tipping me for a like and if you'd like to see more videos like these, please consider subscribing. I spent this amount of time on this video and would really appreciate any type of support. I really enjoy making these videos and like I said, it's my dream to learn and make art. I was familiar with the USC before making this video, but studying about the beginnings of it gave me such a reviving appreciation for the sport. Making this video took a lot of time and stress, but it was very, very fulfilling. As of currently, I'm uploading every other Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. If you think this video is relevant to a group chat, consider linking this video over. If you have an unusual question, let me know in the comments. <laughs> okay, so, so the video is over, but I just want to ramble on about some more about how great MMA is. Oh, another super cool thing about MMA is that it doesn't discriminate. The fighters don't care where the technique came from. If it works, it works. You won't have somebody who really hate the Japanese and refuse to use a judo throw or somebody who hates Brazilians and not use a rear naked choke. Modern day mixed martial arts is truly a global art. It's an art form that is legit from all over the world. I know romanticizing it, but god damn it, man. Just so beautiful. I'm probably going on for a little bit too long. <laughs>